Howdy, how's it going? My name's Davy Chappie, and it's time to go over the newest book released as one part of a three-piece set, Monsters of the Multiverse. This book acts as a catch-all for D&D players looking to get as much content as possible, pulling in popular creatures from Volo's Guide, Mordenkainen's Tome, and miscellaneous source books to update them for a new era. And it also updates not 10, not 20, but 33 races to both bring them up to speed and consolidate them into one place so that you don't have to buy five different books to catch them all. As always, keep in mind that the majority of this is just my opinion, so if you feel like it's really shady to put your massive book expansion inside of a $160 combo, set? Don't worry, we'll talk about that. But with that out of the way, let's begin. So, like I said, Monsters of the Multiverse is one part of a three-piece combo, the others being Xanathar's Guide and Tasha's Bowl. Because the other two comprise what is basically the totality of expansion rules for the general D&D player in regards to everything but races, Monsters of the Multiverse was tasked with acting as the next rendition of Volo's Guide, giving a bunch of new rules for monsters and races for players and DMs to punch each other with. However, Mottum decided to do something a little bit different, in that it doesn't include any new material, but it updates a lot of the old material that people have had problems with in the past. For instance, the Cadaver Collector, an ancient war machine that stands on the cutting edge of fashion, now has the unusual nature trait so that people can't strangle the robot to death anymore. Its summon specter ability was also changed to a bonus action instead of a trait, so the stat block actually makes more sense to look at now. There are hundreds of these little updates, and I'm just one man, so if you see something on this list that you use in your games, check out this updated version. The big thing is that every creature with spellcasting abilities has been updated to help the DM manage it all. See, the developers realize that spell slots are a great system when you're a player that's running through a dungeon and you only have to worry about yourself, but it can get real annoying for a DM who has to constantly keep track of every spell for every spell slot for every level of every enemy. So instead, spellcasters get a list of spells that can be cast at will, three times per day, once per day, etc. To ease the burden of note-taking on dungeon masters who may be running, say, a magic school. Other than that, the only thing in this book are the aforementioned 43 races, and I know that that's what you're here for, so I'm gonna hit each of them briefly to compare their old stats to their new. Then I'll do bigger, in-depth videos to replace my classical guides, since this book took that series out back and shot it in the kneecaps. Two things to note about every updated race is that any spells that said race casts can now be casted using spell slots as well. And you can use whatever mental stat you want to cast them. They also officially threw out ability score improvements and racial languages in favor of Tasha's do what you want rule, so I'm not gonna repeat myself every time it comes up. Just know that they all do it. But without further ado, Aarakocras! Fun fact, this is the first book that these guys were in because they were first released in a tiny pamphlet for an adventure book that no one played. But their claim to fame was being able to fly. And they can still do that, but their speed was reduced from 50 feet down to a more manageable 30 feet. And their walking speed was changed to 25 feet as a way of punishing you when you get too close to the sun. Their talent damage was increased from 1d4 to 1d6 so that you actually have a reason to use them, and they've spontaneously learned to cast Gust of Wind once they hit third level. ASMR! ASMR can be small now, probably to imply that ASMR don't have to be human, but maybe they just like cherubs. The biggest change is that all three ASMR subclasses have been consolidated into one big feature, the Celestial Revelation, which you get at third level and then can choose one of the three options that basically function in the same way as the old sub races. But the main difference is that all the damage no longer scales off of level because it's proficiency time, baby, and the Scourge ability no longer hurts you because that was a really silly feature. Healing Hands doesn't scale off of level either, now you just get a d4 per proficiency bonus which means higher lows and lower highs. Bugbear! Y'all won't believe this, but bugbears are goblinoids now. They also count as fey, so charming them is harder. Their sneaky trait specifies that they can comfortably stand in a place sized for small creatures, despite literally being long-lived, powerfully built monsters. And also, their surprise attack was reworded so that you no longer need the surprised condition, you just need to take a turn before they do. Centaur! Can you believe that these guys first came out all the way back in Ravnica? Anyway, centaurs are completely unchanged, except that their survivor skill was renamed to Natural Affinity, because they had to justify some reason to include the centaur in this book. Changeling! The biggest change about the Changeling is that they were given the fucking coolest art in the world. Also, they're Fey now? They're Fey now. Technically, their Changeling instincts also include performance as a possible option, and their shape change now explicitly does let them change their size from medium to small, but it's mostly the art for me. Deep Gnome! The first of the sub-races to burst out from the loins of its parent race is the Sferf Nebulin, who basically have nothing in common with their subclass counterparts, except that they're small, they can resist mental magics, and they have super dark vision. These Deeper Gnomes have an altered camouflage that works anywhere, but can only be done per proficiency before you have to take a Long nap. They also get spells in the form of Disguise Self and Non-Detection, which, hey, is more than they used to get. Duergar! Unlike the Deep Gnomes, Duergar have an easier time rectifying their subracial counterparts, keeping the Duergar magic, Extendo Dark Vision, and Dwarven Resilience, but changing their Duergar Resilience to work against stuns instead of paralysis. And now they can walk as fast as a normal person, so good for them. Eladrin! I'm not sure why these guys are their own race. They literally keep everything the same, except now their summer form scales off of proficiency, and it's their trance feature that keeps them from falling asleep, if that's a change you care about. Fairy! These guys literally just came out and they already have been reprinted. And they have not been changed. Furbolg! The biggest change for these guys is their lore. Now they have the soul of the forest inside of them, but jury's out on whether they've actually seen a tree before. Concerning this stat block, Hidden Stuff gets more uses that scale off of proficiency, but otherwise they receive no updates except for this little blurb by Tasha. Janasi! Janasi got weird. They all count as their own race now, despite the fact that they all have more in common than they did when they were all part of one group. Now, all the Janasi get dark vision. Fire Janasi lose their red vision, by the way. And they can all be either medium or small, depending on if you want 
play a chibi elemental. Past that, they're all different, so... Air Genasi! Wind Boys can move 35 feet now, they have lightning resistance, and they've got shocking grasp and feather fall in addition to the old levitation spell, thusly turning them into more of storm boys than strictly windbags. Earth Genasi! Earth Walk was reworked so you can now walk on any floor-based difficult terrain, and they get an additional new spell in the form of Blade Ward, which I thought was a practical joke. I thought you were kidding! I thought it was a joke! I even wrote it down in my diary! Veronica had a very funny joke today! until I read that they can cast it as a bonus action per proficiency. So, yeah, new tank meta. Fire Genasi! The only one anybody used to play. Like I said, they lost their red vision, but it's still dark vision, so I guess you can just pretend. And they get flame blade on top of their usual spells. Water Genasi! They lost shape water, but they get acid splash instead, which I think is dumb, but maybe I'm in the minority. Also, they get water walk. Gith! Much like Genasi, I don't see a reason why the Gith were split up, other than to keep the book's format streamlined, but at least here they don't have much in common besides a new resistance to psychic damage. So, Gith Yankee! Basically, completely changed, the Gith Yankee only keep their psionic spells, but their martial prodigy and decadent mastery traits get mashed up into one trait that lets you pick a skill and a weapon or a tool to be proficient in per day. Gith Zarai! Completely unchanged, aside from the universal Gith psychic resistance. However, I do want to mention that due to the way that innate spellcasting is handled now, the Gith Zarai is your one-stop shop for granting any spellcaster access to the shield spell. Use that information how you will. Goblin! Everyone's favorite representation of manic monkey brain energy has been gifted with Fey Ancestry, and Fury of the Small was changed so that both the damage and the number Number of uses scale off of proficiency, but you have to take a long rest to refresh it. Is that better mathematically? Depends on how many naps you take. I prefer it, but that's because I keep my goblins up all night making content. Goliath! Natural athlete and powerful build were consolidated into one condescending trait, and now you can use stone's endurance per proficiency. Which, what? Who said to do that? I get it, you're swapping all of the short rest uses for per proficiency, but you have created a stronger beefcake than the barbarian, and it can be a barbarian, you monsters. Herringon! I just want to point out that some poor developer made what they thought was a really witty pun and named this race after it, and now that nobody caught on to the joke, they had to add a blurb where Morden Kanan explained it. We made the book people explain their joke, guys. There aren't any changes, by the way. Hobgoblin! Wow, these guys have completely changed. I don't even know where to begin. They've gone from being a militaristic society to being basically Feywild bards. For instance, Saving Face has been transformed into Fortune from the Many, effectively drawing on the energy of friendship to do the same thing that Saving Face does, although now the cap is plus three, and it's per proficiency instead of short rest. Then they get Fey ancestry like their goblinoid siblings, they get a new feature called Fey Gift, which lets you take the help action as a bonus action per proficiency, and at third level you get to choose between three additional effects every time you use your bonus action help. That'll grant temp HP, increase movement speed, or impose disadvantage on an enemy attack. If you're a Hobgoblin Puritan, you can flavor these abilities as your character just being a very good leader, but I'm feeling some major culture shock whenever I look at this smiling red boy. Kenku! Everything is just a little different. Expert Forgery is now Expert Duplication to better represent that it can recreate items too. Mimicry no longer challenges your deception, it just has its own DC calculator, and the bonus proficiency choices were expanded to two of whatever skills you want. Plus, you can give yourself advantage per proficiency on whatever skill you already have proficiency in. Apparently, Kenku are being reimagined to have a supernaturally good memory, which only further brings up the question of how do they keep forgetting words? Kobold! Another one that basically got replaced with an evil duplicate. This kobold loses everything except its size, and it gets a bunch of new abilities that essentially boil down to, we're sorry we made the dragon babies into unmitigated cowards. Now, kobolds grant their allies advantage by roaring instead of groveling around like a wimp, but it's basically still the same ability, just per proficiency instead of short rest. And they get three semi-subclass options at third level that give them an extra proficiency, advantage against fear effects, or a sorcerer cantrip. I will deeply miss pack tactics, and I don't think any of the kobold legacies make up for it, but now all the people who hate sunlight sensitivity don't have to worry anymore, because that's gone too. Lizard folk! Look on a mask of my boy. The bite is still the same, the natural armor is still the same, Hunter's Lore just got renamed and they added medicine as a choice, but it's otherwise unchanged. Hungry Jaws is per proficiency instead of short rest like everything else. You can even still hold your breath like normal, but they removed Cunning Artisan! The coolest thing about the race and they threw it out because they didn't want to tie down a race to being tribalistic. Why even play a lizard folk anymore? To bite things? That's not even one of my kinks. This blows. Minotaur! Virtually unchanged, except that they swap out extra proficiencies for the ability to always know where North is, they've got vulnerability ability to tartar damage, and advantage on survival checks to specifically navigate or track. Or They keep dark vision and powerful build, but they drop primal intuition to steal relentless endurance from their half-orc cousins, and aggressive has been updated so that they don't need to specifically move towards an enemy, and they'll get temp HP for it, but now it's per proficiency instead of just whenever they want. Also, they can be blue now. Seder! Their horns are a bit hornier, going from 1d4 to 1d6 damage. Other than that, they're the same goat boys they've always been. Sea elf! Behold, more elf, still with all of the normal elf traits, but the weapon training has been 
been removed in favor of giving it cold resistance, and maybe accidentally locking its swimming speed to 30 feet instead of making it the same as their walking speed. Oops. Shadar Kai! Same deal as the first version, they just changed Blessing from per short rest to per proficiency. Shifter! Wait, what the fuck is this doing here? This is the least popular race from the Eberron expansion. Did- did somebody ask for this? Is the Vidalcan in here somewhere? Anyway, confusion aside, the Shifter actually got reworked so that its Werewolfian subraces became features within the Shifting ability, and the skill proficiencies that the subraces used to give just got turned into one bestial instincts trait that gives a random proficiency to the base race. The Shifting mechanic got the usual rework of going from per short rest to per proficiency, and the temp HP calculation is now two times proficiency, but the individual transformation abilities remain the same. Tabaxi! Got a few touch-ups, namely an increase in the claw damage from 1d4 to 1d6. They can be small now if you want to play a kitten, and their climbing speed is equal to their walking speed now instead of being capped at 20 feet. Tortle! In addition to having a small option, Tortles get that natural weapon buff of 1d6. They've gone from having no need for armor to being explicitly barred from wearing it, not that it makes a difference. And their survival proficiency is slightly changed to be either survival or animal handling, medicine, nature, perception, or stealth. All in all, basically the same turtle. Triton! Their casting of Wall of Water was replaced with Water Walk, their ability to talk to fish extends to elementals and monstrosities as well as beasts, and their swimming speed is tied to their walking speed now, which means that they're both increased together as well. Very minor changes, but maybe they'll be enough to convince someone to try out the Triton. Yuan T! Wait, is this the last one? Hell yeah. For starters, Yon T dropped the pure blood from their name. They can be small now to represent that they were created by transforming other species into snake people. Their immunity to poison was dropped down to resistance. Their magical resistance no longer works on magical effects, only spells. And they actually have a little bit of art that isn't just one sexy snake lady. Having played a Yon T up to level 9 in Joe Cat's Belkinus Necrohunt, I never saw this race as too groundbreaking. And I really don't bat an eye at these sort of nerfs because they solve such specific problems that I barely even encountered over half a year of playing. Oh my god, that was a lot of races. So, hopefully this video has helped you make an informed decision as to whether or not you want to buy Monsters of the Multiverse, but I really want to mention something before I end this video. It is not necessary to buy every expansion and rules update in order to play D&D, but whenever something new comes out and I don't get it, FOMO hits. Especially when it's one of these big expansions, the importance of getting it is huge, because D&D is a very social game, and trying to talk to your friends when a new book releases is just them reminding you, hey, have you seen the new book? That's why I find it really scuffed that the biggest rules expansion since Tasha's is locked into a three book set that costs between $150 to $160 to get. It's not like no one would buy Monsters of the Multiverse otherwise. People are already treating these like new races, especially since multiple sub races were turned into new races via this book. I get that it is, by technicality, not an expansion, just a revision, but it doesn't change how the community treats it. These will be the stat blocks of all these races now, by order of the rule of new, and preventing people from buying the book unless they purchase it in a bundle that also includes the two best selling expansions in 5e basically guarantees that people are forced to repurchase a book or two that they already have unless they're very new to the hobby, or they'll otherwise have to find alternative ways to get the book that haven't been sanctioned by the crown. The worst part is, even if you're new, you can buy both Tasha's and Xanathar's for 30 bucks on Amazon, so you're paying an extra $100 for a big book of errata. I don't know, maybe I'm salty because I'm sort of obligated to buy these books as part of my job, but I feel like there are easier ways to fuck me. Have you tried Tinder? But that'll about do it! I hope you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like, comment, subscribe, ring the bell, check out all my social media in the description below, and maybe support me on Patreon so that I can afford to continually pay Emma for making increasingly longer and longer videos. But yeah, Davy out.